I just thought I would do a quick check-in. I'm in my car, uh, in the passenger seat of my car. This is where I hide out in my lunch breaks. Sometimes when I just need to get out of the building, get away from people. Yeah, hiding out in the car with a book. So I am reading The Old Nurse's Story. I'm more than halfway through the first story in this um, Little Black Classic. I have met the ghostly child that roams the moors in uh, Northumberland and it's good, I'm enjoying it. Uh, spooky, yeah, gothic, what I was hoping for. Um, this is the first thing I've ever read by Elizabeth Gaskell and I really like her writing style. This has been a really good introduction so far to Elizabeth Gaskell's books. Um, it's making me want to read other things that she has written, so I'm enjoying that. I've also been listening to Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte, um, as narrated by Amelia Fox. I'm not sure I could say I'm enjoying that one quite as much. I enjoy the writing style. It's definitely making me want to read something else by Anne Bronte. I've not read anything by her before. But it's just the kind of the theme and the topic that I think I'm not feeling that engaged in. Um, I just feel incredibly sorry for uh, Agnes Grey <laughs> doing this kind of job with these obnoxious people. <laughs> but I suppose that was the point of the book. She was trying to highlight to people what it feels like to be a governess and how governesses are treated. But then obviously a lot of people did jobs where they weren't treated very well in the Victorian era. Um, I don't think governesses were exclusive to that. Um, it is making me reflect and think about how kind of Victorian societal expectations were placed on people in terms of what they could say and what they could do and what they could wear. And I think I'm about halfway through the book. Maybe, yeah, about halfway through listening. It's OK. I'm glad, I've, I'm glad I'm listening to it because I would like to list, uh, either listen to or read all of the Bronte sisters' works. But it's, I don't think it's going to be my favourite Bronte book. So that's where I'm at with that so far. Okay, so that's where I've got so far. Just a quick check-in. Better get back to work. I'm just here to check in again about The Old Nurse's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell. I have finished the first story, which is The Old Nurse's Story, which is the first of two short stories in this little book. I enjoyed the first story. I thought it was really atmospheric. To me, it felt like a kind of traditional ghost story. It is based on a nurse who ha is reflecting on a time when she was a much younger nurse. She's caring for a young girl called Rosamond. The early part of the story focuses on how they come to find themselves living in a very isolated, remote, gothic mansion. And they're both living there with an elderly relative of Rosamond called Miss Furnival. Yep, Miss Furnival and her, and her companion. And it's when they're living in this house together that the nurse and Rosamond start to experience some strange and unsettling occurrences in and around the house. I'm not going to say any more than that about this book because it is only a really short story. So if you're interested to pick it up, I don't want to give any spoilers away. What I will say is that I think this little short story is about so much more than just a ghost story. Yes, it's a ghost story, but it also has a lot to say about societal expectations at the time, attitude to the time and the treatment of women during that era. So it's got a lot to say in quite a short story. With regards to the second short story in this book, which is called Curious If True, you will see that this book still has a bookmark in it. And I am... Um, about halfway through the second story and I've just not wanted to pick it back up again. The second story is a, a kind of letter extract from a character called Richard Whittingham and it's all about his visit to France. While he is out walking he gets lost and in attempt to find his way back he finds a grand house where there appears to be a, a, a party going on. And this short story appears to be about all the characters that he meets at that party. 
The back of the book describes them as um, fairy tale characters, so I think the story is drawing on kind of well-known fairy tale characters. So I will pick this book back up and I will finish the second short story, but it's very low on my list of priorities at the moment, and the second story just hasn't captured my interest in, like the first one did. Again, I'm just here to check in with you about how I have got on listening on audiobook to Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. You will have seen from a previous clip that I wasn't particularly um, enjoying listening to the first half of the audiobook. And I think on reflection that's to do with my own personal feelings towards the English gentry, maybe? The first half of the book is very much about Anne trying to deal with the privileged offspring of certain families for whom she works as a, as a governess for, the Bloomfields and the Murrays being two of those families. What the book does do is it really highlights how these privileged families treated, were treating their governess and how they attributed ridicule and blame to the governess for the way their the children were turning out even though the parents didn't seem to be taking any responsibility for the raising of their own children. This book has been described as somewhat autobiographical in the sense that Anne Bronte worked as a governess for five years herself so you do get the sense that she's probably drawing on her own personal experiences of working with different families but for me this felt like a book of two halves. Throughout the book I did find Agnes's character very engaging and I liked Agnes. She works hard to seek her own independence and to find a paid position and she really does show quite high levels of resilience in the face of isolation and criticism. I found the second half of this book much more engaging if I'm honest and I think that's because one of the charges that um, Agnes is responsible for caring for, who's called Rosalie, enters society and at that point it really gives Agnes the opportunity to demonstrate her emotional res emotional intelligence maybe is the word that I would use to describe it and without wanting to give any spoilers away it's the second half of the book where a love interest develops for Agnes. I did really appreciate the writing style in this book I think sometimes if you listen to a classic on audiobook that you've not read previously you can sometimes miss parts of the language that you would probably appreciate even more if you read it in book form. I imagine when this book was first published it was quite impactful and it probably served as a good um, preparation for other young women who were contemplating becoming governesses at the time. Agnes is not the only strong character in this book. I also really like the character of Agnes's mother and later on in the book they really do together demonstrate high levels of resilience and determination. As I said in my previous video, overall I'm glad I listened to Agnes Grey and I am planning to read Anne Bronte's other book which is the Tenant of Widefell Hall I think and I think I have that on my shelf so I am looking forward to reading that. I think I will enjoy it because I did enjoy the writing style and I think the themes will be somewhat different. So I've also started reading my next Victober book which is The Strange Case of Dr Chickle and Mr Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. I'm really enjoying this book so far. What surprised me about this book is I didn't expect to meet the character of Mr Hyde so early on and for some reason I just assumed the narrator of this book would be Dr Jekyll but it isn't. It actually comes from his friend, I think Mr Utterson is the, 
appears to be the main narrator of the story. And again, like a lot of Victorian classics, there's a lot of emphasis in here about societal expectations and the importance of appearance. What I'm finding is that I do want to keep picking this book up and finding out more. It's only a really tiny book, but I don't read a huge amount every day, so a little book like this can still take me at least a week to read, but so far it is really engaging and you can see I'm, I've already tabbed a few things. So I will check in with you once I have finished this one. Bye for now. Hi everyone, I am here to do another check-in for my Victober readathon. I apologise if the lighting on this video is a bit dark, but it is evening here uh, in Yorkshire and it's already starting to get quite dark, so at the minute this is the best I can do, so I hope it's okay. I just wanted to check in and talk a little bit more about The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. I have to say, I really did enjoy this book. I didn't really know what to expect from this book going in, I thought I was familiar with the story of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde because you hear it referenced a lot and as I said in my TBR video I have been to the theatre to see it uh, as a, as a theatre production but that is quite a few years ago but this book surprised me in a good way. For such a small book this had a lot to say and as the tale progresses it just has it becomes more and more impactful and builds over time. As I said in my earlier check-in, I wasn't expecting to hear quite so much from the friends of Dr Jekyll and I think their thoughts and beliefs and ideas really does give a sense of what it was like for middle-class people in the Victorian era in terms of how they felt obligated to live their life, even if it kind of clashed with kind of who they wanted to be as people. Obviously the two most interesting characters in this book that I was most interested to find out about was Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Mr Hyde is portrayed as the complete opposite of what Victorian society middle classes expect expected of a man at that time. There was one issue that I struggled with with this book and I think it's because I've read this book with more modern eyes and more modern values and beliefs. And that is the way that Mr Hyde's physical appearance is used to signify him as being evil. And it used as it's used throughout the characterisation of Mr Hyde. I appreciate that was probably a belief held at the time, but as a more modern reader, it makes for uncomfortable reading. And it's that trope that is used still today, I think, in some books where somebody's physical appearance, their physical difference is somehow used as a signifier to mean that they are somehow evil or bad or less than or not the norm. The character of Mr Hyde is described as deformed on a number of occasions and that is very much synonymous with the idea of him being an evil character. This book is often referred to as a story of good and evil and I think that probably reflects ideas at the time around good and evil and also the fact that Robert Louis Stevenson did have a religious upbringing and had been brought up to kind of believe in the concepts of good and evil. However, the whole time I was reading this book, I just kept getting pulled back to another book that I have read, and that is this book here, which is Carl Jung, Knowledge in a Nutshell. So this is kind of like a summary book of um, the work of Carl Jung, and it really did feel like there was a lot of contrasts between these two books. This book talks about the duality of human nature and it even makes reference in the book that man is not truly one but two. 
there's also a section in this book where Dr. G where we're hearing from Dr. G. Curl later on about how he believes that people will come after him to continue his ideas that there is more than one character within a person. And I couldn't help but feel like the work of Carl Jung had kind of taken those ideas and developed them further. This book actually makes this book actually makes reference to the character of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde within it. And it talks about how there are different characters within the self. And that within all of us there is kind of a, a shadow self that we are often that we often feel the pre the pressure to suppress because it's not acceptable and it's not seen as okay and that is very much what you get from this book as well. So it was really interesting to have read these two books within the same year and for them to draw on such similar themes. The thing that I found most interesting about this book is that we only really start to hear from Dr. Jekyll in the final chapters of the book and at that point the atmosphere within the book has been building and building and building. The, the two characters within himself, which are obviously Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it, they've become unbearable for him at that point and he only feels like he can survive by separating one from the other but he also acknowledges that one cannot live without the other. And that is very much a kind of thing that I gained from this book as well, that we have to learn to live with those parts of ourselves, the, the, the good and evil as referred to in this book, or the kind of shadow self, um, and the part of ourselves that we choose to put forward in public. So in summary, I really enjoyed this book. I feel like it's a book I'm going to come back to. I think I'd like to listen to it on audiobook. I think it would be a very immersive experience. And at the end of these, reading this book, I couldn't help but think how amazing it would be to get Robert Louis Stevenson and Carl Jung together in a room to, to kind of discuss their theories and their beliefs. And I, I know that would never happen, but it just would have been such a fascinating talk to listen into. So that's it for this one. This book has been a great success for Victoria. This video you have seen a bit of a vlog what well, started out as a vlog <laughs> started out as an oct as an autumn vlog it is the books that I some of the books that I read in October for Victober I'm very aware that this is very late <laughs> going up onto booktube the plan to continue to do the rest of the autumn vlog in November went a bit skew if <laughs> it didn't happen I just got too busy at work and I got a bit unwell, kind of cold flu season, all those types of things. But I didn't want to um, not share about the books that I read in October and November, even though I'm aware Victober feels like a long time ago. The rest of this video is just going to me having a bit of a chat about the books that I did actually read in November to bring my kind of vlog, recent reads, wrap up thing that this video is to a close. So the books that I planned to read in November were mainly books for Indigathon and I will link down below my TBR video and attempt to put it in the cards above if I can. But these were the books that I planned to read and I'll just go through how I got on with each one. So the first book that I was planning to read was American Sunrise by Joy Harjow, which was a poetry collection. I started reading this poetry collection in e-format which I was able to borrow from my library. I don't have an e-reader so I was trying to read the poetry collection on my tablet and I struggled to be honest with you. I 
struggle to use an e-reader. It's something I've tried and dismissed in the past. I, something I found very difficult to focus on. And I found trying to really appreciate and follow the poetry in this book quite difficult on my tablet. I did start reading the poetry collection and what I read of it was absolutely fantastic. It was a very moving poetry collection. For that reason, what I have done is I've added it to my kind of wish list of books that I hope one day my library might have a paper format or if not that I will, might be able to purchase this poetry collection at some point. But for anyone that's interested, I'll kind of summarise what I did get from the poems that I read so far before I decided that I, the format wasn't working for me. So the very beginning of the poetry collection, um, there is an explanation of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, in which indigenous tribes um, in America were expelled from their land, and it shows a map of the Trail of Tears. This was something that I didn't really know a very much um, uh, a very great deal amount about. So the poetry collection itself sent me to Google to go and find out a little bit more about that and learn more about that. Some of the poems that I did read interweaved historical events within Indigenous history in America. So there was quite a lot of ancestral trauma within some of the poems and some of the other poems were the author herself reflecting on the death of her mother. So this is a very emotive collection of poetry. The poems that I read were very powerful and it's definitely, definitely something that I do want to be able to read in full at some point, but I just need to find a format that's accessible for me. So if you are a poetry reader, I would definitely recommend this collection. The next book that I started in November for Indigifont was The Yield by Tara June Winch. So I listened, started listening to this book on audiobook. The narrator of this audiobook does an absolutely fantastic job with the narration. The narrator is Tony Briggs. The book is written and narrated in a very lyrical style. And it was so compelling to listen to that when I was listening to it, it just kind of stopped me in my tracks sometimes. It just requires your undivided attention when you're listening to the audiobook. There are three main narrators within this story. The first one is Albert, also known as Poppy Gundawindi, who is a sort of grandfather figure within the story, who knows that he's dying soon. And in his part of the narration, he is trying to make a record of the events that he remembers both from his own experiences and those of his ancestors and he's trying to capture a record of the language of his indigenous tribe. The second narrator within the story is August Gundawindi who is the granddaughter of Albert and when she returns to her ancestral lands for the um, after the death of her grandfather, she discovers that the lands have been sold to a mining company. And it's very much about her fight to try and preserve the lands for the future of her indigenous tribe. The third narrator within the story is a character called Reverend Greenlift, who is a reverend of German origin, who feels he has a mission to help the Aborigines during the time during that time and his part his narration is his story being told to us from history the story that reverend greenleaf tells us is very poignant and it shows that despite his attempts to try and support and in and help the aboriginal people during his time that he just repeatedly comes up against disdain and indifference from the authorities. So those were the those are the three main narrators of the story. I haven't actually finished listening to this book yet. The reason why I stopped listening to it was because I felt like it needed my undivided attention. It's not a book that I feel like I would want to fall asleep to because it deals with some difficult issues and I wouldn't want to miss some of the important 
parts of the story by sort of drifting off and falling asleep part way through, which is what I tend to do with nighttime audiobooks. So during um, December, I'm planning to read mostly kind of seasonal, festive, wintry books. So I am planning to carry over The Yield by Tara June Winch into 2022 to, uh, to a time when I can just sit and just listen and pay attention to the book. So the next book that I plan to read and did read in November was Healer of the Water Monster by Brian Young. This was also for Indigathon. This is a middle grade book about a young boy called Nathan who goes to visit his grandma Gnarly at her mobile summer home in an, at the Navajo reservation. And what happens is one night Nathan is um, out um, on the reservation when he comes across a um, water monster in need of his help. And the book is all about his journey to try and help the water monster. The water monster comes from the Navajo creation myth. And before reading this book, it was something that I didn't know anything about. So I did find myself stopping the book to go to good old Google uh, to find out a little bit more and try and understand a little bit more about that. One of the characters in Nathan's life um, was his uncle Jet who brings with him some difficulties when he returns to the reservation. He is um, a person who's was a member of the forces, so he's an ex-forces person, and he has a lot of difficulties with alcohol dependency and mental health issues. So this book does tackle some difficult issues, and Nathan tries to help his uncle Jet within the story as well. The one thing that I struggled a little bit with this book is that it has quite a lot of magical realism within it, and I am not sure if magical realism is a genre for me. Every time I've picked up a book that's got quite a bit of magical realism in it, I, I sometimes find myself sort of thinking, what's going on here? Trying to sort of apply too much logic to it and work out what's happening. So there was a few times in the book, just small parts of the book, when I was a bit like, what, what on earth is, is going on here? Um, but that's more about magical realism not being my genre rather than there being anything wrong with the book. So it was a really lovely bedtime listen, actually. And then the final book that I read for Indigathon was The Soul of an Indian by Charles Alexander Eastman. This was a short um, audiobook that I listened to, which is available on the Audible Plus catalogue. If anybody is an Audible member, it is something that is available um, as a free kind of edition. This book is very much written of its time. So this book was actually published in 1911. So throughout this book, Charles refers to himself and his indigenous community as Indians and refers to the non-indigenous community as kind of white men or settlers. But I think it's about recognising that was the language, common used language at the time of publish, publishing this book. Within this book, Charles contrasts his life growing up within his indigenous community. So he was a traditional woodland Sioux and that's how he was a, a, a raised as a child. He talks about the traditions, the beliefs, the values, spiritual practices and the relationship that his indigenous community had with the natural world as he was growing up. And he intersperses that and contrasts that with his life after he became what he refers to as civilised, which is obviously at the time what he was taught to believe, um, that once he kind of joined the um, white man, I suppose, and converted his religion, I think he converted to Christianity. Throughout the um, book he recognises that connection and the relationship with the natural world that he had was far greater and far more symbiotic I suppose is the word I would use when he was within his indigenous community. So it covers themes like that. Um, it's definitely something that I think would be interesting to people who want to find out a little bit more and I think Charles Eastman is, is a 
interesting person that I am planning to kind of read a little bit more about and find out a little bit more about him because he sounds like a very interesting character. And then there were two more books that I um, read in November. The first one is The Women of Heachley Hall, which I have here by Rachel Walkley. This was a book that I picked up just to kind of, it was my bedtime read book in um, November. As I said, I was having quite a difficult time with work and a few health issues. So I wanted something that was really easy and not going to be a challenging read and not going to have difficult themes. So this was the book that I picked up. This is a sort of contemporary fiction, I suppose, intertwined with some historical fiction about a woman called Miriam who discovers she has um, been left uh, Heachley Hall by her great aunt Felicity. So she's inherited Heachley Hall, but only within conditions. So there's an unbreakable condition within the will of Aunt Felicity that says Miriam has to live in the property, just live in the hall for a year and a day to be able to either keep the property and live in it or sell the property. At the time, at the beginning of the story, obviously Miriam doesn't know why that is and she has not had any contact with Aunt Felicity since she was a small child. So she doesn't know anything about the backstory. So this was a really nice, easy read for me in November, which is kind of just what I needed. The book starts out in autumn. It's quite spooky. It's a bit creepy. There's some spooky woods surrounding the house where um, Miriam is staying, Heachley Hall. And she can sense there's something in the woods or senses a presence in the woods. And there's also these unexplained happenings within Heachley Hall when she's staying there. She's living there by herself. The conditions of the inheritance is that she does have to live there alone. And then the book moves through time through winter. So it was quite nice because as I was reading this book, it started to feel very, very wintry here in North Yorkshire. We had a, our first very heavy bout of heavy snow. So I was sort of reading along as winter appeared in this book. It felt like winter was appearing here as well. So she has to live in this very de decrepit house by herself. And what she's trying to do in the book is search for the answers as to why her aunt put the conditions in the, the will and try and f understand a little bit about the aunt's backstory and in doing that she also starts to discover the history of Heachley Hall and the previous residents and what was going on at Heachley Hall in the past and some of the past stories that the house has to tell. So that's The Women of Heachley Hall by Rachel Walkley. And then the final book that um, I read was another audio book that I actually listened to which was a, a bedtime book which I picked up after I finished The Healer of the Water Monster and that was The Frequency of Us by Keith Stewart. So The Frequency of Us is about an elderly gentleman called Will who is living in um, a property that has has been somewhat neglected for many many years and he is in need of care because he's become up come to the attention of social services and um, local authorities because the neighbours are unhappy about the state of the property. And a young woman called Laura is um, given the role of going in to assess whether Will should remain in the property or whether he needs to be taken into permanent care, into a care home. So there's these two characters that come together in the story. And what Laura discovers when she meets Will is that Will talks about how he was previously married to a woman called Elsa Klein, who was a German refugee during the Second World War. And he has all these stories that he tells about his time, where how he met Elsa Klein and um, the life that they led together. But when Laura speaks to the authorities about Will's life, they say there is no evidence that Will has ever been married or that this character called Elsa Klein ever existed. So this book is very much about Laura working with Will to find out the truth of Will's life and the truth of his current situation. I'm not going to say any more than that because I don't want to spoil the book for anybody. But this was a really lovely bedtime listen for me. Um, it was a contemporary 
read with historical elements interweaved within it. Um, the historical elements are very much set around the Second World War. It was a good read, I really enjoyed it actually. The narration was good, um, it was something very nice to fall asleep to and it was one of those books where you just kind of feel satisfied at the end of it. So if that's something that might interest you I would recommend that for a kind of light, either easy read or easy listen if it's something you're looking for. Those are all the books that I either read or listened to in November. Sorry this video is a little bit of a mishmash of it starts out with a bit of a vlog and just turns into a kind of reading wrap up but I didn't want to have TBR videos where I said I was going to read things and then not come back at some point and talk about them so I hope the format of this video is not too kind of chaotic. <laughs> so that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye!